This season, we've taken you inside the TSA and ZooMed and introduced you to many passionate people who are doing good for the reptiles on this planet. But you've never seen anything like what you're about to encounter today. No, it's not the Garden of Eden, but it may as well be for someone like me. If you're a turtle or tortoise lover, you want to create the best possible captive situations, the best possible enclosure for your animals, and you want to do the most good. Well, where I'm standing today happens to be my favorite place on Earth. That is not my house. This is the Turtle Conservancy, and what I'm going to take you behind the scenes on today is going to blow your mind, because this was started by one individual who was really passionate, just like you and I, about our turtles and tortoises. So today, it's all about the Turtle Conservancy. A good portion of my life has been all about action, which still holds true. But now I pour all that time and energy into wildlife conservation, education, and the pursuit of knowledge. This is Camp Tenor. So I'm joined now by Paul Gibbons, who is the director of the Turtle Conservancy. I, I bug him often with emails asking about, what should I do? I have this uh, problem with my turtle or tortoise. Paul also happens to be a world-class veterinarian. Uh, so, you know, you wear many hats here, don't you? I wear a lot of hats. Yeah, I mean. Plenty to do. Yeah, there's always something to do. In fact, we're kind of walking past the pool that sometimes is for humans, but the last time I was here, you guys took in a rescue of how many uh, western pond turtles? 32 western pond turtles, and yeah. you, you helped us to remove some of the calcium deposits right, that had yeah. formed on the shells of those turtles as the lake dried and the calcium levels went up in that lake. We were scraping, we were scraping turtle shells in the most gentle way possible to kind of help them out. And, and what was the end result to that? Well, after, after we hibernated those, they were waking up in the springtime and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife identified a lake that was nearby. Fantastic. So, so we were able to take all the turtles and release them back, right, basically less than a mile from Lake Elizabeth. That's incredible, man. So what we're coming up to right now is the Galapagos tortoise enclosure. And again, everything here and what inspires me so much, Paul, is just the, the amount of care and landscaping and, and so many really beautiful things. Yeah, so look at this guy. I mean, this is just an incredible tortoise uh, shelter, huh? So it's got the radiant heat floor. And it's it, it's uh, circulating warm water in the floor. Oh my God. But even little touches, like this is the stuff I get most excited about. I just love <laughs> like how the, the landscape, it's built into the landscape and there's just such an attention to detail. And now Eric Good, who actually was one of the founders of the Turtle Conservancy and whose property this is on, Eric's other passion is hospitality. Uh, hotels, restaurants, uh, he owns a few hotels and restaurants in New York City. We are in California and we're gonna go inside and we're gonna see what's happening over here. So who do we got here? Is this Daphne? That, that is. She belongs to the Honolulu Zoo. Okay. And she's 48 years old, weighs about 370 pounds. No way. She's 48? <laughs> yeah. That's a young, that's still a young she's Galapagos. Still very young. Yeah, that's yeah. incredible. The cool. others are, are, they belong to the Gladys Clover Zoo in Texas. Right. Good deal. Yeah. Good deal. All right, man. Well, let's move on. This is basically the nerve center. This is the main uh, facility for the Turbo Conservancy, right? Yeah, this is what we uh, started in 2005 and have bred uh, currently about 14 species, okay. hatching about uh, 200 a year. When talking about hatching, is this is this where the incubators are this still? This is where the incubators are. This is where are. the magic happens? <laughs> Let's have a look. This is the, the kitchen where we prepare all the food for the, the animals. These guys are doing it up right. And this is actually really cool. I think Maurice Rodriguez, did he help you guys out with these? Yeah. Oh, man. So these, these, are, these are our incubators and they're modified wine coolers. Yeah. So we put thermostats in and heating elements and fans and uh, humidity sources. 
unreal. And then there, uh, right there, look at this guy's uh, all labeled, you know, some of the most incredible animals on earth. Radiated tortoise, forced an eye, uh, just, my wow, gosh. Air tortoise. Oh my gosh, yeah, Those look at that. pretty rare eggs. That's probably the rarest tortoise eggs on earth right I now. I would say so. Certainly in captivity, so yeah. fingers crossed. And we'll be bringing you a really cool episode on the plowshare tortoise from the Turtle Conservancy. But let's have a look at some of the little guys. I know the, right. the folks at home are probably let's dying see. to see some more tortoises. Let's see if something's oh. hatching. Oh, cool. That's always fun. Oh, boy. The other cool thing about the incubators is you guys have put that um, tinting on the on the screen there, on the window. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. that it's it's more... The light is dimmer, and we, we don't know if that has any effect on incubation, but these guys, they hatch out of nests that are in the ground where there's no light, yeah. so I don't, I don't think they need any light. Sure. There is this one that I keep watching closely. It's a four-sense tortoise that's due to hatch any day. Well, maybe we'll get lucky. Maybe we'll get lucky. <laughs> Let's do a little candling here, All right. see if you guys can see what's in there. Oh, look at that. Yeah, there's some veins. Yeah, so you see some nice healthy blood vessels right there. Okay. And this one is, is really close to hatching. Right. This, this dark line right here is actually the edge of his shell. So this guy is... He's close to it. So close. Yeah, sometimes yeah. when you candle, you'll actually not even be able to see anything because they're taking up the entire space of exactly. the egg. Exactly. Exactly. That's awesome, man. Yeah, Forced and I, what a beautiful, uh, you know, hatchling. I just, I'm in love with them. I do a lot of the Longata, and they're mm -hmm. closely related, but the coloration on the Forced and I are just, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, it's, it's great kind yeah. of salmon color. Yeah, just a nice animal. And for me, you know, living out in uh, Florida, they do really well in the humidity. They love that kind of high humidity. Yeah. But uh, Yeah, we, we keep them indoors. You can see their parents if you like. Yeah, let's do it. Right. Uh, it feels nice. This feels like home in here. It feels nice and humid in yeah, here. We're making Florida here. Yeah, you're doing a good job, man. Look at this. This is so cool. Well, right, right now we have a few of the species that, um, the, the habitat in here, because again, we have circulating hot water on the floor. Okay. It's good humidification. So it, and, and in the winter time, when the sun is at a low angle, we get a reasonably good amount of sunlight in. Gotcha. Um, in the summertime, we actually don't get much sunlight because the sun is so high in the sky. But right now, so this is where we have our breeding colony of uh, Forsens tortoises. Okay. And you know, there's one right over there though. You can kind of see right beyond that little step stone. And, and the other thing guys, why we're not just running in and out of any of these enclosures is because they do a very good job of trying to be as biosecure as possible, not cross contaminate the animals. You noticed he had gloves on. Uh, he wasn't going to do any kind of exam on me, yeah. thankfully, <laughs> but he was actually just being uh, very careful uh, with the animals. So when we're here, we have to be very respectful and mindful. We don't just reach in and grab things, you know, That's right. uh, but I would look at the colors on that radiata. Yeah, that that is nice incredible. One. My goodness. <laughs> Holy smokes, man. That is beautiful. Um, how many uh, radiata do you guys have here on, on the premises? Well, the answer is too many. Ah, I see. Because, <laughs> because uh, radiated tortoises, when, when John Baylor brought these tortoises here, he gave us a directive. He said, breed these animals. And it took us a few years to get going, but somewhere around 2009, 2010, we started to have some success. Now we hatch between 50 and 75 radiated tortoises a year. Oh my goodness. And this, this is a species that, um, their population in the wild has declined by 50% in the last 15 years. They're uh, under pressure, not only from the pet trade because they're so beautiful, but also just local bushmeat. Right. And hmm. that, that's a problem that we're not solving anytime quickly. The thing is, even though their population has declined by 50%, there's still somewhere around 6 million of them. So the 50, 75 that we hatch every year, taking those back to Madagascar and letting them go is not going to be... Yeah, it doesn't matter. No, it's not yeah. going to matter. Gotcha. So, so we're working on ways to uh, create more assurance colonies around the world, uh, continue to en enhance their, their captive breeding so that we do have an assurance to the, 
what probably is fairly inevitable that they, they will probably become extinct in the wild just because these pressures are so difficult. But yeah, um, we're, we're having good success. And, cool. and they're, uh, they look active. Yeah. <laughs> they're happy. They're man. happy tortoises. <laughs> so we are uh, inside another one of the, I suppose, greenhouse sunroom and we're about to pick up, uh, or Paul's about to pick up, the, one of the rarest tortoises on earth, if not the most rarest tortoise. Wouldn't you say that? Well, it's this one is, is tough. It, there are two tortoises that vie for that position, the okay. geometric tortoise and the plowshare tortoise. Gotcha. The geometric okay. tortoise from South Africa. They may have more in the wild, okay. but they don't live in captivity. Nobody can keep them alive. Wow. So there's no way to protect them other than protecting land in the wild. Plowshare tortoises, there are less left in the wild, less than 500, maybe 400 or less. But we, they do breed in captivity, and we have an assurance colony in Madagascar. Dural Wildlife Conservation Trust has been breeding this species for oh about gosh, 25 yeah. years in Madagascar. Now, where, you know, you haven't had successful breedings yet with your plowshares. That's but, right. Yeah, so where did these offspring come from? These are probably about four years old, maybe. Okay. And they came from the wilds of Madagascar. Wow. They took uh, some sort of a transportation over to Asia okay. and these these were confiscated ah, in Hong Kong. Okay so these actually are straight out of the illicit wildlife trade right now in Madagascar month to month there could be a new government there um, so there's really not a lot of policing so that's why you have animals being shipped out of there and just they're pillaging that that country and it's one of these bio hotspots isn't it it's just an area a small island or rather medium-sized island uh, but it contains so much wildlife and diversity of wildlife and this is just I mean looking head-on if you just looked head-on I mean this is the almost the, the illustration of a tortoise right just yeah. that beautiful round dome shell that little face uh, <laughs> they're just incredible at what age do they start to get the uh, you know the real nice plow you know if you if, can you see between a male and a female well, I, I would say that you can't distinguish sex based on the shape the, the of, shape of, of that, okay. yeah, that plow or goular or scoot or mm -hmm. epiplastral projection, whatever term you want it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw some 25-year-olds last year that were all in a group that was going into a conservation breeding center on Mauritius, and they had little ones. They were about that big, and they had a little curl on the front. They were tiny. But you could see on, on our adults that we have a female with okay. one that's about that long. Oh, and the okay. males is about that long. I didn't realize, see, that's something I learned just yeah. right now. I didn't realize that both male and females have yeah. the Guler projections. I mean, females are usually a little shorter. Okay. But it's... It's still pronounced uh, Yeah, you, it's not a good way to determine whether they're male or female. You just got to <laughs> wait for them to show you. Yeah. All right, well, we're going to kind of move along to yet another interesting area of the conservancy. Okay, what these, are we doing? These are some of our, our hatchling golden coin turtles. These are from last year's hatch. Oh, and awesome. They are scheduled to go back to Hong Kong. Really? Turtle Conservancy is the, the first organization to ever return captive born animals for conservation. That's incredible. That is exactly the goal when yeah. you guys set out, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, so that's, that's right. any like TSA, uh, TTPG, but, and the Turtle Conservancy, you guys beat everyone to it. Well, we congratulations. <laughs> uh, that's a race we all want you to win. That's you a, know? And we, we'd like to keep racing on that. Yeah. Every, everybody should be contributing to that one. And I said animals, I meant turtles. Right. Turtles of and course. tortoises. Of course. Now, this particular critter right here, this is Quora trifasciata, the golden coin turtle, and it is extremely sought after. It's an Asian species, and it is sought after for traditional Chinese medicine, and that's what's making this poor little guy so rare, because what are they doing? They're actually scooping out the liver or what what part of this animal do they think is going to save them well it's an interesting story traditionally okay. actual tradition they said that if you cut off the plastron and grind it up into a jelly it's a general health tonic good for the kidneys good for the liver blah 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 about um, it was the early 90s there was a breeder a turtle breeder okay. who wrote a book and in that book he said they cure cancer. Oh boy. The price of this turtle went from about uh, 50 or $60 a turtle to $2,000 a turtle in about five years. Oh, All because no this guy wrote a book saying it's traditional. Yeah. So tradition started in about 1992. <laughs>
he was a well I, I suppose the term charlatan that's a good term yeah, charlatan to, yeah. they don't cure cancer they do better in their own shells in yeah. the streams and ponds so that's fantastic it's a nice story to hear about animals being released back into their native range I love the greenhouses fall because they you know they remind me of home uh, you guys have a very dry climate, but some of the animals you are working with, pretty much, you know, high humidity loving animals. Uh, oh yeah, look at this down in here. That's some, sometimes called the Ryoku black bested leaf turtle. Yeah, let's have a look. Okay. Oh, that's amazing. Dude. And this is a, a terrestrial turtle species, so these guys, you know, will utilize, you know, they're kind of found in forest, obviously, but they will utilize small pools. They're not really strong swimmers, are they? Surprisingly, um, Eric loves to tell this story, but he made a nice video out of it. Okay. They went to look for this turtle, okay. and they were looking at streams and, and water bodies, and they couldn't find them. So they went and found a local researcher who had been studying them, and that guy said, bring your flashlights. And Eric said, we're going out in the middle of the day, we're not bringing flashlights. So then they went out with that guy, and the guy starts looking in holes. They actually live in, in deep burrows up to your, wow. up to your shoulder, in no rocky root-lined root burrows. Yeah, they're, they're highly terrestrial. They really don't spend much time in the water at all. Incredible. All right. Yeah. Well, there you have another. I'm getting schooled left and right here, man. <laughs> there's, there's close to 300 or just about 300 different species of turtles and tortoises, so it's hard to know everything about all of them. It is. And what's neat is these guys are working with some animals that you just don't see represented in captive collections. So, obviously, you guys are definitely going to do the... Uh, do the homework by going to their right. uh, geographic locations. Right. And that's the one cool thing that you guys get to do. I mean, you, you've you actually done a lot of good work uh, in the past year uh, in the Philippines. Yeah. You, you traveled out. So not only is he here, but the, the Conservancy sends him abroad when there are large-scale conservation efforts that are needed, like the, the Philippine turtles. Uh, what species was that again? Seban Rachiella latensis. Okay, the latensis. Mm -hmm. and, and basically the entire what they believe might have been the entire wild population was poached out of a few uh, lakes in the Philippines and they got the animals, he worked them up and you know, yeah. it's, it's we, good work. We got, Paul. we got them back into the wild. Fantastic. All right, so here's a tortoise that I'd love to work with. However, unfortunately, you know, I am not uh, a proponent of wild caught animals. And unfortunately, you see this animal kind of brought in every once in a while uh, from the wild and right. it's just not the way I like to operate, but this is the. You the, want to see one that was horse. born in captivity? I would, yeah. This one. Oh, nice. Look at this. So, this is the impressed tortoise. This is um, actually in the genus Minoria, and they're related to the Burmese brown and black mountain tortoise. Um, but they're a little bit more colorful and different shell shapes. So, look this, at that. Yeah, this tortoise was born here in about 2008. Wow. Mm -hmm. In 2008? That's pretty darn good. Yeah, it's almost an adult. That's insane. And you can see these guys have the long legs too. They do some climbing, right? You they know, sure they, do. That's, yeah. that's, in, look at that. that's insane. That's a good looking leg on a tortoise, <laughs> man. I mean, that, that is, you know, definitely helping them out. But, you know, just going back, how difficult was it, you know, why I would never spend the money on these? Uh, because they just don't do good when they come out of the wild. It's very hard to acclimate them to captivity. A lot of uh, mortalities at the time. Yeah, the vast majority die within a few years. Mm -hmm. And so you have the parents of these that survived long enough to breed in captivity, yep. but didn't survive much longer. Insane. They just yeah. don't, they don't acclimate to captivity. But the captive born ones, they, if, if you treat them right, and they have, some, they have some sensitive requirements. They're from higher elevations, 3,000 feet and above. Okay. Uh, three to six thousand feet and kind of scattered across Southeast Asia but if you if you think about cloud forest environments and keep them in a cloud forest environment then they do really well all right I mean this guy's really heavy um, it's kind of I'm getting tired just holding okay, yeah, yeah. and you can see the new growth I love the new growth yeah. and they have almost a marbling at the mm -hmm. uh, seam there mm -hmm. that's really pretty um, but I've never seen to be perfectly honest it's it's rare you see a a very colorful, you know, yeah, really, yellow head. Really I mean, beautiful. It's animal. a nice looking animal, yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. The impressed tortoise, man. Gosh, so it's it's eight years old. Yeah, eight years old. Look at old. that. Yep. I did math on the fly, guys. <laughs> I'm not very good at it. That's why I like tortoises, you know? I need to use my fingers. And probably well. close to breeding size. Right. I, I would say maybe within a year. Or two. What is full size on this animal, though? Uh, we do have some adult males, okay. and I, I could show you an adult male. Yeah, I'd love not, to just not see that. Not much larger than this. Well, are they over here? 
All right, let's put this yep. one down, but you'll okay. have to change your gloves, right? I will. So. Okay. I just want to keep you honest, Paul. I don't want to <laughs> I don't okay. want to cross contaminate. Right. Currently not sharing enclosures. At some point okay. they probably will cuz this is a female and that's a male. Okay, got you. Uh, but at the moment we're still keeping them separated. All right, let's have a look. All right. And I'll grab you if you fall, Paul. Okay, thanks. I got your back, dude. You ready? Yeah, man. Okay. Go ahead. It's, you don't have to. No, no, I got you, man. <laughs> I got you. It's a team effort here to get these out to show you folks. All right. All right. Nice. Oh, wow. Yeah, they are a little bit bigger, but they're not. Not that much. They're not that much bigger. No. My gosh. But that's so, really cool. That's a wild caught at all. That is a, how long has that animal been here? Um, 2012. 2012. Okay. Yeah. yeah, four years, three and a half years. What, what would you say the biggest challenge uh, you face acclimating this species to captivity. What what is the the, the thing that kind of makes them dive the like, well they they come the they come through markets that are um, they, they come in large numbers they're um, they're stressed they're not fed uh, they're basically in in a cesspool yeah. feces right so they're they're septic when they come and so you have to get their immune system boosted so that they can fight off the infection. Okay. And because they're so sensitive to stress, it's a special challenge to get this species to have a strong immune system. Yeah, and then not only that, they're stressed when they come, but you putting in antibiotics or any kind of uh, you know medicines yeah. is stressful too. Just picking yeah. them up like this. We never pick them up, uh -oh. so this is a special day. Okay, well put them down. <laughs> okay. I don't put them back, okay. dude. I don't want any trouble here, man. Yeah. Thanks for showing them. What are you doing? <laughs> See what we do for you folks? Thank you very much. All right. You just rest, little buddy. All right. Thanks, Paul. Well, let's go look at their uh, larger cousins. All right. All right, man. I know who these are. Um, I actually have a group my own, of my own. Uh, however, they are not quite as large as yours. These are the Burmese black mountain tortoise. And would you say about the fourth largest tortoise on earth, wouldn't you think? Definitely one of the giant tortoises. Yeah, certainly. Look They're, at this. They get to be maybe 80 pounds or 85 pounds probably. Oh my God. It's insane, man. These guys are incredible. I won't, uh, again, there's a quarantine type situation here. I'm not going <laughs> to be stroking them. But uh, how many do you guys have uh, at the center right now at the Conservancy? Well, we have two males and um, five adult females. Wow. And then we have quite a few of their offspring. Yeah. We're raising some up that we've had for about 10 years and are getting near adulthood. This species, man, I mean, this must be... You know, you have the Minoria Impressa in the greenhouse, more controlled situation. This must be a little bit more challenging, you know, being in Southern California, it's a little drier. Uh, what do you guys, what do you guys do? <laughs> How do you manage this? Well, I, I've actually been asked that question a lot. How, okay. What do we do in the summertime? Because okay. we have um, weeks sometimes that are over 100 degrees. But you could see where we are right now is mm -hmm. very shady. We have yep. a, a thick canopy of um, live oaks. And we, we use sprinklers and misters gotcha. and we keep the enclosure moist. And what we discovered, they actually won't even nest. They won't lay their eggs in a nest unless you have a moist composting pile of leaves for them to build that nest. Ah. We put, put different kinds of leaves in and if the leaves aren't moist and they don't compost, they won't. They won't breathe yeah, because they, that's they what's won't. generating actually the the heat. Yeah. To keep so it stimulates them. They know right. it when yeah. they they'll pile the leaves up, but they won't nest unless it starts to compost. My God. So they do need moisture, and we have some little ponds. I, I like to think of them like hippos. You know, hippos get under the water and they just stick their nose yes. up. These guys are the same way. It is. It's it's a lot of fun when you see these guys utilizing their entire enclosure and utilizing the water features because I have a large female, not quite that large, but she's good size and she just loves to take those extended spa yeah. breaks. Um, but the other cool thing about them also is they're you know, they're pretty capable climbers, man. You you never have escapees here, huh? Well, we modify the wall to make sure that they can't escape. Yeah. Every once in a while, they, they teach us where the weak spots are, and then we modify the wall. Gotcha. Well, the good thing is, is they're not exactly fast. So when you see them eyeing things up, you know where to go. Well, yeah. you know, Paul, listen, I have to thank you, pal. I mean, I know you're always so busy, and you're always so accommodating to me. Sure. I get some certain privileges, like 
crashing out in the uh, hacienda and so on. And well, we'll let these uh, animals get ready for bed. Thanks so much. I know you want to go home. Yep. I, don't worry. <laughs> you can keep your gloves on. You probably right. want to. I'm I'm not exactly uh, bio secure. Yeah. So we'll see you guys again real soon. It was a pleasure. Thanks, Kenneth. You got it. Hey campers, be sure to check back with us next Tuesday when we return to show you the world's most beautiful plowshare tortoise habitat. See you then.